Well, this is King Rex coming at you with another reply video. I'm just going to reply to the 10 worst presidents in American history by Mr. Bean. I already did his 10 best. And this is kind of similar that I agree with some of his picks, but I disagree with some of his picks. We'll go ahead and let him get started. Dream. According to my opinion, this is just my opinion. I'm a little biased. Uh, we all are, so keep that in mind. I'm. He doesn't mean he's biased, at least. Also aware that this may reveal some of my political beliefs, and that's fine. But without further ado, let's just jump right into it, as Philip DeFranco says. Number 10, Benjamin Harrison. I disagree with this one quite a bit. Harrison was a very accomplished president. But we'll let uh, Mr. Beat go further. Okay, he was all about really high tariffs, and you all know how I feel about tariffs, right? This is really one of the worst and least intelligent ways to rate a president, the I don't like tariffs motif. I mean, I know we've all been kind of been fed the idea that tariffs are bad no matter what, but let's be honest, tariffs, as one other um, YouTube creator said, are just a tool in the toolbox that a president has. So to say all tariffs are bad, blankly, doesn't make sense. If you actually look at tariffs before the Great Depression, it was usually times of low tariffs where the economy was bad and higher tariffs where the economy was good. Um, the Panic of 1837, low tariffs. The Panic of 1857, low tariffs. The Panic of 1893, low tariffs. Um, the Depression of 1920 and 21, low tariffs. And those were the four worst economic depressions before the Great Depression in the country's history under the Constitution. So to say low tariffs are bad, I mean low tariffs are good, high tariffs are bad, just doesn't make sense. There's also things about tariffs that are better than other types of laws. Um, first and foremost, tariffs actually protect businesses, which mean they protect jobs. So yeah, they do raise the price of goods a little bit, but any tax is going to cost you money. But they protect American jobs, so at least they help with employment. They also, um, it's hard to avoid payment of tariffs. Um, other taxes intrude on privacy. I mean, if you look at income taxes, you have to lay your entire financial history bare to the government. With tariffs, you don't have to do that. Um, other taxes are costly to administer. Without um, other forms of taxation, you do not need the IRS. Um, they can be very complica complicated to comply with um, because you have to hire tax lawyers and accountants just to comply with the federal taxes. Um, uh, and they also are generally inequitably applied. Um, I'll give you a good example. I know a guy who makes probably four to five times as much money as I do a year, and four times as much is probably not, I mean, that's a reasonable estimate. Um, his wife makes more mother money than me too on top of it, and he bought himself an electric car, and because he bought himself an electric car, he got a special tax break. I bought an American-made car that was not electric, that cost a fourth of what the car he bought was, and I got no tax break. Um, so I went to college, paid my way through, never took out any loans. My brother went to college, decided to move away to go to college, took out lots of loans. He gets tax breaks because he took those loans out. Um, I bought a modest house, got a good interest rate. Um, because I have a house that doesn't cost a lot and I got a good interest rate, I can't like take my house off my taxes, the interest because it would actually cost me money. Many other people who buy more expensive houses can take those taxes off. These are just examples of how taxes are inequitably applied. We're under tariffs, everyone pays it, it's equitable. Right, right, I'm not a very big fan of tariffs. Bad job, Benjamin. Harrison was supportive of the overthrow of Queen Leopoldani and the taking of Hawaii. Well, this is actually, um, he did support annexing Hawaii when the provisional government of Hawaii asked to be annexed. He, he did put it through the Congress to be approved, but he didn't like push for the queen to be overthrown. And is actually there was a um, under Cleveland who was against taking Hawaii because he probably just didn't want brown people added to the United States. They actually did an investigation. It was found that the government of the United States and the military did not act in the overthrow of the queen. Which is one of the shadiest parts of American history. Also, 
So I also want to put that um, the queen was overthrown because she was trying to overturn the um, constitution of Hawaii and the people overthrew her because of that. It wasn't the United States government coming in and just overthrowing her. Well, the Wounded Knee Massacre occurred under his watch. It is true the Wounded Knee Massacre occurred under his watch, but if you look at every president, I think you get up to about, through him, all these presidents had something that happened that was negative towards Native Americans. The Wounded Knee Massacre is one in just a long line of such tragedies, and we also had some negative things happen under Teddy Roosevelt with Native Americans as well. So really... These things happened. They happened under all the presidents. I'm not saying that what happened under Harrison is justified by it happening under other presidents, but I'm saying that you can't really consider something that happened under two-thirds of the presidents to be extremely bad under him because his Native American policies were better than a lot of other presidents. The presidents with the worst Native American policies were um, Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren, and Grover Cleveland, and... We'll see if they make this bottom 10 list. Let's just put it that way. Okay, not only did Harrison approve, but the Army gave out Medals of Honor. Yes, the Army Army gave out Medals of Honor. Well, the Medal of Honor was a recently created thing at the time, and really there was nothing to give Medals of Honor out except for things that happened in Indian Wars. So yeah, they gave out Medals of Honor, and it was the Army giving out medals of honor, not Harrison. Like they were candy afterward for a massacre. So I think he's doing is he's trying to play on your emotions a lot there to get you to agree with him. Um, he also leaves out a lot of really good things Benjamin Harrison did. Benjamin Harrison built the modern U.S. Navy. Like, it really didn't exist before. And there were some still ships, but there wasn't enough. Um, he fought for civil rights, including the first president asked for anti-lynching laws. Um, he signed the Land Revision Act, which allowed for all the um, conservation under Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft. He shot to sign the Sherman Antitrust Act, which allowed for all the trust busting under Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft. He signed the Judiciary Act of 1891, which um, reorganized the courts and gave a Court of Appeals, so the Supreme Court didn't have to take all those cases. It was getting backlogged. Um, a lot of good things. He also signed a um, general um, uh, disabled um, veterans law, which was good because, number one, these, there were individual ones passed through Congress, which were clogging up Congress. And number two, these types of laws existed before that. I mean, James Monroe passed one for veterans of the American Revolution. This was a similar law. So he did a lot of really good things. He also ran a surplus when he was president. And since he left office, only two other presidents have ran a net surplus during their term in office. Um, Warren Harding and Calvin Coolidge. No other president since then has run a net surplus. Every other president that has actually gone up under it went down in his term. Number nine, Andrew Johnson. I agree with this. Johnson was really bad as president. Um, Probably, I'd actually probably rank them worse because I imagine that tens that tenth worst and one would be the absolute worst. So I'd put him a little lower on the list, but not much. He was really bad. Now I wasn't going to put him on this list. I feel like a lot of historians talk a lot of trash about him unfairly. Actually, historians have historically been too fair to Johnson. I mean, generally bought into his whole lost cause of this um, Confederacy thing. They said that he was some sort of hero for fighting against Reconstruction. Um, it's only recently that they started holding that against him. Um, yes, he was really bad. I don't think he's ever been unfairly treated, even today. The only thing I'd say was unfair now is that even though he was really horrible as far as being too stubborn and being far too racist and being too pro-South and his domestic policies, he was actually a pretty good foreign policy president. Um, he bought Alaska from Russia and he got uh, Max Millen out of uh, Mexico, which confirmed the Monroe Doctrine. And the economy was actually pretty good under his term. He did things to help the economy. But he was so bad in human rights and so stubborn that he was a really bad president. But, you know, I'm all about character, right? And this guy was driven by his ego. This guy cared first and foremost only about his own legacy. Um, most presidents care about their legacy. There are some presidents that care more about doing what's right. Um, 
if you watch his top 10 video, two that I really think did a lot, that did things that hurt their re-election chances, but they did what they thought was right for the uh, country, did not make his top 10 list. I'm not saying that they should, but um, Gerald Ford, part of Nixon, knowing that if he let Nixon twist in the wind, it would help his re-election chances because everyone wanted to get Nixon. And George H.W. Bush broke his no-new taxes pledge because he did what he thought was right for the country. Those are presidents that put their political life on the line to do what they felt was right. Um, Warren Harding's another president. He stood up against the um, uh, bonus bill, which and he made a speech as to you not paying for this and all this, which was a wildly popular law. So that was three presidents that really go against their, you know, do something that would go against their chances for re-election out of what they think is right. But most presidents do look at their legacy. In his own desires, he refused to compromise, and he seemed to dig in his heels when... Um, that's something that Grover Cleveland was very well known for. He refused to compromise, and he dug in his heels a lot. That's why he kept, kept vetoing everything. And he faced opposition. Speaking of opposition, just as blatant opposition to civil rights for African Americans, as seen with his fighting the 14th and 15th Amendments and Civil Rights Act, I mean, that ended up holding back African Americans for generations. This he is correct in this assessment, but this same assessment would put Grover Cleveland down here with Andrew Johnson. This makes him look exceptionally bad, and he was a white supremacist, but mostly, though, his stubbornness in politics. I'd say his white supremacy is a bigger reason to rate him lowly than his stubbornness. His stubbornness was bad, but being a white supremacist and being pro-South in the hopes that he would get renominated is worse. I mean, I know the radical Republicans that he opposed were also stubborn, but his refusal to compromise with them just made it look like... Even if the radical Republicans were stubborn, the fact is there was enough Democrats and moderate Republicans in Congress that he could have came up with a compromise, but he pushed the Republicans towards the, the radical Republicans when he vetoed things like the um, renewal of the Freedmen's Bill and a Civil Rights Act that I think that became one of the amendments of the Constitution, I think the 14th Amendment. So he pushed the regular Republicans towards the radical Republicans by his stubbornness. So, I mean, yeah, there's radicals wouldn't have worked for him, but the radicals didn't control Congress until he did those things. And he also went around the country making speeches that were most likely drunken speeches, where he basically was attacking other people, especially members of Congress. So, yeah, he pushed the Congress to a more stubborn position against him. Like he only cared about his own selfish desires and didn't care about the greater good of the country. Number eight, George W. Bush. I disagree here. I know Bush is a big whipping boy for a lot of people, especially academics. Um, but realistically, I think he's underrated. He's not a 10 worst president. I mean, he's got him worse than Andrew Johnson. Let's be honest. Is what Bush did really worse than what Andrew Johnson did in sending African Americans back 100 years? I don't think so. Okay, obviously I'm even more biased living through the presidency of George W. Bush. This is another thing. If you admit that you're too biased to rate someone properly, you probably just shouldn't rate them. You should probably cut your ratings off before you get to that president. I mean, I don't rate the last few presidents because I think you need more time, but I can rate them in an unbiased manner, but I still think you need more time to um, get a little perspective of how they acted as president. So yeah, he shouldn't probably be rating Bush if he admits he's too biased to rate him accurately. But I disagreed with his response to the 9-11 attacks in several ways. The AUMF, or the authorization to use military force against... Okay, now the thing here is that everybody wanted this. The Senate voted unanimously for it, and only one person in the entire House voted against it. So when everyone but one person votes for it in Congress, it's kind of hard to um, complain about it. And everyone was calling for this. So it wasn't just like Bush. And the fact is there was no like made up thing. It's not like the Gulf of Tonkin resolution under Lyndon Johnson, where it was reported that ships were being attacked. And then um, they later realized that it was just a radar malfunction and told Johnson after that that there were no attacks. It was just like a phantom attack. And Johnson took the first report and ran with it to get the declaration for the Vietnam War. Um, it's not one of those situations. This is something everybody wanted, and the facts were out there for everyone to see. Against terrorists, basically give a blank check for the 
president to fight terrorism around the world. It's still in effect. The Patriot Act, which really was one of the worst laws ever passed in American history. There are a lot of laws that are worse than the Patriot Act. Um, a lot of, um, like if you look at the Indian Removal Act under Andrew Jackson, um, the Kansas-Nebraska Act under Franklin Pierce, um, a lot of people say the Fugitive Slave Act under Millard Fillmore, the Embargo Act under Thomas Jefferson, um, you got the Sedition Act under John Adams, you have the Sedition Act of 1917 in the the Sedition Act of 1918 and the Espionage Act of 1917 under Woodrow Wilson. So there are really a lot of acts that people would say are worse than the Patriot Act. Um, I think the Patriot Act you still had to work through and get some type of approval before you started surveilling people. I just think it made it a lot easier. Um, plus, the country did this stuff under Lyndon Johnson without no law in the 1960s. They really just stripped many civil liberties that Americans used to take for granted. The Iraq War. Um, the justification for the Iraq War, actually they did find weapons of mass destruction. They just didn't find a nuclear weapons program. Um, and everyone around the world thought they had them, including countries in the area like Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Um, I would I would agree that he probably would have been better off to go into um, Iran and Iraq because I think they're a bigger threat. But I the fact is this guy seems to not like any wars. So if you dislike all wars, I guess you dislike the Iraq War. Although he never says nothing about. I would still say the Iraq War is way better than Vietnam under Lyndon Johnson. That was a total shit show. Dragging out the Afghanistan war with. We see now what, what happened in Afghanistan and the um, completely failed withdrawal that maybe we should have kept people in there. Plus, the fact is we still have um, military soldiers stationed in places like Cuba, the Philippines, Japan, Germany, and Italy. Why are these places okay to keep troops in from wars from very long ago, but not Afghanistan and Iraq? Plus, the withdrawal troops from those two countries... Um, caused major crisis because you had um, ISIS coming out when they were through troops from Iraq and Afghanistan is just a total mess right now. So, plus Afghanistan was going after the terrorists, the country that, you know, helped the terrorists that attacked us. So I don't see how that's a bad war. With no end in sight, not a fan of all these things. His response to Hurricane Katrina. Hurricane Katrina was not his fault. You can't blame him for a hurricane. Plus, the way the laws were written at the time, the governor of the state had to ask for help before the president could give it. That was the way the law was written. And the governor never asked for help. Beyond that, the funds that were given for flood mitigation were misused by the state and local governments. Once again, not Bush's fault that the states basically did things wrong. The Great Recession happened under his watch, and... Um, this is another one that makes no sense because you have to look at what caused the crash if you want to blame someone, and things Bush did didn't cause it. Um, people say deregulation, but the deregulation happened under Bill Clinton. Um, the Community Reinvestment Act was put in by Carter and changed under Clinton. Um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which Bush warned about, were buying up all these bad loans and rolling them into derivatives and selling them on the market, which caused the toxicity in the market. And it was the Federal Reserve that started raising interest rates, which caused the whole thing to come down because the only way to make the bad loans work that were required by the Community Reinvestment Act, it basically made banks make subprime loans, was through variable rate loans. Well, when the interest rates went up, the rates on the loans went up, people couldn't afford them. And then another thing that encouraged it was Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac would buy those loans so the banks could make underwriting fees on the loans and just sell them off to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So really, it wasn't Bush's fault that this happened. It was other things that happened before he ever became president. The only thing that happened during his presidency that was part of it is the uh, actions of the Federal Reserve, but the president does not control the Federal Reserve. The most they can do is ask for um, the Federal Reserve to act in certain manners. And he responded to it with crony capitalism, which I'm not a big fan of, bailing out banks and corporations. Um, the TARP funding, although called a bailout, they just didn't hand money to banks like people think. What they did was they bought up assets from the banks, 
They turned around and actually sold those assets for a profit, but it didn't put liquidity liquidity into the market, which is why the um, recession was rather short. Um, the economy TARP funding happened in the third quarter, or no, I'm sorry, the fourth quarter of 2008. Um, the economy performed really bad in the first quarter of 2009, but it performed much better in the second quarter, and it was out of recession by the third quarter of 2009. So really, the TARP funding worked, and it wasn't a bailout like a normal bailout. I mean, they they just bail banks out and got nothing back. They bought assets. Etc. Mm. No Child Left Behind. No teacher I know actually is a fan of No Child Left Behind. The reason why teachers don't like No Child Left Behind is because it forced teachers to be responsible and for um, what they did. They were um, basically teachers had to you know, I can't think of the right word now. Teachers were basically responsible. They couldn't just um, teach. Um, like, No Child Left Behind held teachers accountable. That's what I'm looking to say. And yeah, I stumbled all over that. I'm sorry. Um, basically, if the students weren't learning, the teachers were held responsible for it. And that's why teachers don't like it. Um, before what they would do, and this happened a lot, I've seen it when I was in school, a student would fail, they'd make them repeat the grade, and if they failed again, they would just push them up to the next grade to get them through. I knew a kid who failed fifth grade, sixth grade, not fifth grade, he failed sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade. It took them all twice. Um, I met another person who graduated high school in the late 1980s that could not read or write. Now, he maybe he didn't graduate, but he did go to high school. How do you get to high school without being able to read or write? Plus, if you look at it, nothing that replaced no, all the stuff that replaced No Child Left Behind, like Common Core, is way, way worse than No Child Left Behind. All No Child Left Behind said is that states would set standards for testing and schools had to pass the test or at least be improving. And he increased funding for education by 80%. Not only that, No Child Left Behind was a very bipartisan law. It was real with Ted Kennedy, so it wasn't just Republicans, passed House 384 to 45 and the Senate 91 to 8. So it was, very, it was a very popular law until Bush became unpopular and then the Democrats turned on it. So really, No Child Left Behind, teachers don't like it because it holds them accountable. Not a good law. He expanded the surveillance state. The Department of Homeland Security, the TSA, all that. Detaining suspects without warrants who were never charged with any crime, never given any due process. Um, suspects without warrants, these aren't like people they're capturing within the country, although that happened under Ray Lincoln. These are terrorists and enemy, enemy combatants, and you don't, you know, need a warrant to, to um, capture POW. You don't charge POWs. You don't give POWs due process. These weren't American citizens. This just showed that he often made decisions out of fear, not out of reason. Um, well, if you look at it, there was no major terrorist attack after 9-11 during his term in office on U.S. soil. So he did pretty good with that. That's such a nice guy, though. I love you, W. Sorry about this, if you're watching. Number seven, Woodrow Wilson. For I agree, Wilson was absolutely terrible. But he does have a lot of coincidences with Teddy Roosevelt, who's like his sixth favorite president, so it's actually kind of funny. First of all, Cypher from The Cynical Historian has definitely influenced my perception of Woodrow Wilson. Wilson! So a shout out to him. Go watch his two videos where he just completely bashes him. Wilson was all about spreading democracy around the world, a very egocentric foreign policy. He claimed this for spreading democracy, but it's not really spreading democracy if you remove an elected leader from a country and put who you like in place, which is what he did in Latin American countries a lot. And he also rewrote the Constitution of Haiti. So yeah, he wasn't for spreading democracy. He just said he was for spreading democracy when he really wasn't. See, sure, it said, hey, self-determination, right? But it assumed that Americans knew what was best Plus, his self-determination really didn't make a whole lot of sense because um, Yugoslavia was a country that was created of a whole 
bunch of different, you know, ethnic groups jammed into one country. Plus, people in Austria actually considered themselves to be German, but they were not put in Germany. And a lot of sections of Germany that were given away to places like Poland and Poland, France, and Czechoslovakia were actually places with ethnic Germans in them, which has caused a lot of the resentment that led to World War II. So, like, once again, he made a proclamation, but he really didn't go by it. Um, he said what sounded good and did, you know, many times the exact opposite of what he was saying. For the entire world, and thus, Wilson paved the way for future American interventionism. One big reason why he got elected in 1916 was because he said he kept the country out of World War I. What it is true this is how he got elected, but it should be noted that he was actually leading the United States into World War I during his first term in office. He just waited until he got re-elected, and he entered the war like pretty quickly after that. Um, he, there's a thing called the House of Gray Memorandum where he... In, House was one of his guys from the United States, and Gray was a guy from Britain, and it basically stated that if peace couldn't be made between Germany, Britain, and France, that the United States would eventually have to enter the war, and they'd probably enter the war on the side of Britain, and he told the British people this, and the French people were told by the British, so they were basically told, hey, if this goes on long enough, the United States will come to our rescue, which they did. They also, also economically, we were at war with Germany for years. We allowed Britain and France to violate our neutrality laws while we got upset about Germany violating the same neutrality laws. So pretty much he was leading the United States in the war, even as he lied to get reelected and saying he was keeping the United States out of the war. What happens after he gets reelected, he gets the country involved in World War I. Plus, World War I is the most pointless war the United States has ever been in. Um, it cost 119,000 American lives. The only wars that cost more lives were World War II and the Civil War, which you could at least argue were good wars. World War I was totally useless and needless, and we should have never been in it. Asking Congress to declare war, and they do. And during the war, the Espionage Act, the Sedition Act, two of the worst laws in American history, urinating on the First Amendment. And Cypher pointed this out in one of his videos. I never knew this, but apparently he wanted the Sedition Act before the United States even entered World War I. And most of our presidents were racist, okay? We've got to consider historical relativism. Um, to call someone racist, if you take them out of the context of their times, I would say... Even though I guess if you look at them from our perspective today, yeah, most of them probably were racist because most of them probably didn't believe that white people were better in some ways than black people, um, but they didn't treat them differently. Like, and that's a big thing. Whereas, like a lot of them, they might have said something that was a little racist. I mean, I thought that black people weren't as good as white people, but they still felt that they should have equal rights under the law. Um, Wilson was the exact opposite. He basically allowed his racism to guide his um, programs. But Wilson was exceptionally racist, even for his time. The screening of the... He was one of the three most racist presidents since the end of the Civil War. Andrew Johnson, who's already been on here, and Grover Cleveland were the other two. Um, and he imposed segregation of the federal government. And the birth of a nation actually quotes Wilson in it. It quotes out of his books. Birth of a nation at the White House and then calling it historically accurate? Not a very smart move by Wilson. Ignoring all the lynchings that were going on across the country when he was president. He ignored a lot of things, apparently. His actions with the birth of the nation actually helped rise to the rebirth of the Klan, which should be noted, too. Apparently ignoring women's rights. You know, he, they were marching across. He didn't ignore women's rights. He actually arrested suffragists. Suffragist against women's right to vote. So he wasn't ignoring them. He was actually acting negatively towards them. It's a country for the right to vote. He ignored them. He ignored the first Red Scare going on. He didn't ignore the first Red Scare. The Palmer Rage, which were done by his attorney general, are what ginned up the Red Scare. So he actually had a hand in that because his guy, and if you look at President put someone in office, that's, they get responsibility for what they do. On a lot of chaos around the country, didn't do anything about it. Number six, William McKinley. This one... I disagree on this one. Um, I know McKinley's a pretty big target by a lot of people, but I think he's overhated by quite a bit. It may surprise many of you because McKinley is consistently ranked in the top half of presidents, usually because the economy... 
I'm actually more surprised that he put Wilson on the list than McKinley because Wilson is a lot like one of his favorites, Teddy Roosevelt. So you would think that if Roosevelt's good, you should think Wilson's good too for the most part. He was good when he was president, and the U.S. was becoming a world superpower due to... Um, I kind of skipped over it a little bit, so I'm going to let you hear it again. William McKinley. This one may surprise many of you because McKinley is consistently ranked in the top half of presidents, usually because the economy was good when he was president and the U.S. was becoming a world superpower due to a more aggressive foreign policy. Um, first off, yes, the economy was good under McKinley and he did take actions that made it good. He replaced the tariff laws that were under place under Grover Cleveland and he signed the Gold Standard Act, which is what fixed the economy. Um, it's also funny that he rates Bush poorly because the economy performed poorly under him, but he gives no credit to Grover Cleveland for the good economy, and it was under Cleveland that the country did become a world power. Um, thanks in part to the naval building um, started under Benjamin Harrison, who ranks poorly, but yes, they became a world power under um, McKinley. And he didn't have an overly invented interventionist foreign policy. He did have a war with Spain, but other than that, he wasn't like going around to all these other little countries in Central and South America the way um, Cleveland, Roosevelt, and Wilson did. So he wasn't as interventionist as other presidents of the time. Well, guess what? This foreign policy sucked. Um, you know, how adult of him and mature of him to say this foreign policy sucked. I mean, that's the way, you know, history teachers should teach history, and he is a history teacher. McKinley's foreign policy was based on a Christian slash American exceptionalism. Most foreign policies of the time were based on American exceptionalism. In fact, is American is America is exceptional. They've done a lot of good in the world, more good than any other country. So to say America isn't exceptional is kind of false. I mean, you don't think America's better than like China, the Soviet Union, or Cuba? get real mentality that meant the u.s was going to be spreading its influence around the world in places it shouldn't be the spanish-american war a war built on lies mckinley you know he struggled with the decision at first but after talking to god god said yes you should go to war with Sp this is completely false mckinley didn't say god told him to go to war with spain it also should be noted that spain declared war on the united states the United States declared war on Spain, but Congress declared it retroactively to the day before Spain declared war. But it was actually declared after Spain declared war. So if another country declares war on you, um, you kind of have to, you know, go along with it and say, okay, yes, we're at war. Spain, and so he went to Congress after that. Oh, plus the lies it was built on, if you actually look at the evidence from the time, the main was blown up by an external explosion. Spain floated the idea that it was internal, but there's actually National Geographic in the thing where they can actually, it actually saw the impressions kind of below where the ship was and the um, boards of the ship were born, blown inward. I mean, there's no explosion that's gonna happen in a boiler that's gonna suck the floorboards up. They were blown inward because it was an external explosion. And they declared war on Spain. The Philippine-American War that happened as a continuation of the Spanish-American War um, this did start under um, McKinley, and it is true that people were in concentration camps, but which weren't like German concentration camps or camps where they held people because there was a guerrilla war going on. Was actually you know an innovation of the Spanish Americans, but it was Teddy Roosevelt, one of his favorites, that told his generals to end the war in any way necessary. And that's when the real atrocities started. That's when they started burning villages to the ground, killing everyone in the village down to the age of twelve. I mean, that's hanging people by their thumbs to make them talk. And that happened under Teddy Roosevelt. And he doesn't, in his video for the 10 Greatest Presidents, mention any of this under Teddy Roosevelt. Or that doesn't get much attention because it makes the United States look pretty bad. But McKinley justified that war, a war in which Americans killed. The reason why McKinley took the Philippines is because he knew if the United States didn't take them, someone else would. And the fact is, is that even though that war was bad, the end result was that the Philippines got their freedom more quickly than they would have because some other country like Germany or Japan would have just stepped in and taken them had the United States not. They also did a lot of modernization in that country. So he did set that country on their way to freedom the same way he did for Cuba because Cuba 
was taken as a protectorate, but they became a free country because of the Spanish-American War. Civilians and rounded them up and put them into concentration camps. McKinley justified this because he thought the Filipinos were incapable of self-governing. Um, so did every other single person at the time. Everyone thought the Filipinos were incapable of self-governing. Even so, this wasn't like something that was you know unique to McKinley. A lot of people didn't want him because they just didn't want those people as part of the United States. And I say those people, meaning that's how they felt about it, not how I feel about it. Self-governing. He was the first to bypass Congress to send troops to fight in China. Um, he may have been the first. Actually, he wasn't the first person to bypass Congress to send troops out. Um, Grover Cleveland bypassed Congress quite a bit, sending troops out. He almost got into war with France, Britain, and Germany on three separate occasions by sending troops out. And he also intervened in... Um, uprisings in Panama and Brazil. So actually I'd say Cleveland sent troops out long before McKinley ever did that could have gotten the United States into war. During the Boxer Rebellion, as I said earlier. Um, it should also be noted that the Boxer Rebellion would fall under, you know, McKinley's usage of the military as commander-in-chief. He didn't go to war with China. He sent troops there to protect U.S. citizens. And they also protected citizens of some other countries. So really, it did go along with, you know, the commander-in-chief respect. I mean, not it wasn't like he declared an illegal war, which has happened in the past, since then. Yes, the economy was doing well under McKinley's watch, but he had high tariffs. And Once again, the high tariff trope. This is the this is the issue I have with a lot of people. That they've been brainwashed to believe that high tariffs are bad no matter what. They don't look at the context of the tariffs or how they worked or anything like that. So, I mean, I think you should have a better understanding of history to look at the nuance of tariffs or just say high tariff, bad. It's kind of like what it came in, high tariff, bad, low tariff, good. And again, I am not a fan of high tariffs. But mostly I'm a critic of McKinley due to his brash imperialism. Um, once again, one of his top presidents, two of his top presidents, had far worse foreign policy than McKinley um, as far as being an interventionist. Grover Cleveland and Teddy Roosevelt. And they both served on each side of McKinley. So why does McKinley get downvoted here, but those two get put in the top, I think, six of all time? Doesn't make a lot of sense. And his general disregard for the sovereignty of nations that just wanted to be left alone. He really didn't have a dis regard for the sovereignty of other nations. The Philippines were not another nation. I mean, they were actually a colony of um, Spain. The United States took some of Spain's colonies. And they did grant independence to one of them, Cuba, but they did take over some of the other ones. But, I mean, and the Philippines got their independence, but the other colonies they took never really asked for. No one here in Puerto Rico wanted to become its own country, from what I understand. Number five, Richard Nixon. Um, Nixon is very overhated, um, so I have to disagree with this one too. I'm not saying he was a great president, but he's not bottom ten. I think you're pretty far out of the realm of reality to put him in the bottom ten. He was a pathological liar who mostly just cared about himself. And um, sounds like he was a politician. Um, Franklin Roosevelt and um, Bill Clinton were. Both pathological liars as well. They cared about maintaining their own power. Whether you think they were good presidents or not, they were both pathological liars and they both cared about having power and their legacy. So, I mean, yeah, Nixon's in the same boat as those two guys. And his own legacy, not the general welfare of the country. Um, I don't think Nixon went against the general welfare of the country. He actually did a lot of good things. I mean, he tried to get crime under control. He got the riots under control that were happening under... Um, Lyndon Johnson, and he did a whole lot of other good things. Um, he got the economy that he inherited a terrible economy, got that fixed. So Nixon wasn't half as bad as he makes him out to be. Boy, did that backfire. I know there are a lot of obvious reasons to hate on Nixon. There's really only one. There's only one reason to really hate on Nixon, and he's going to go right into it. He was a crook. I mean, Watergate. His paranoia. 
Um, Watergate was bad, but not as bad as it's made out to be. The only thing he was guilty of in Watergate was the actual cover-up. He didn't know about it beforehand. Um, he shouldn't have done that, but it was kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation because Watergate happened right as it was leading up to the election. If he admitted that people on his staff committed it, it might have cost him the election. And the alternative was George McGovern, so, I mean... You could make this guy's greater good argument keeping George McGovern out of the White House as reason enough to say Watergate was a good thing. If you're going to do that for people like Teddy Roosevelt, why not for Richard Nixon? Um, but other than Watergate, he was a pretty good, solid president, which is why he won every single state in his re-election except for Massachusetts. He didn't win that big of a re-election by being just this terrible, awful president. Um, to call him a crook, yeah, he did obstruct justice, but he wasn't like a, what I would call a, I mean, presidents do a lot of bad things. I mean, Lyndon Johnson actually had Richard Nixon's campaign in 1968 bugged, and he had um, Barry Goldwater's campaign in 1964 bugged, which is why he did so well, because he knew what Goldwater was going to say, because he was literally, you know, had illegal surveillance of the campaign. I mean, he would have won anyway, but... He won by so much because he did 30 tricks. Yeah, and backstabbing make it seem obvious why he's on this list and most people's lists. However, the war on drugs is probably the biggest mistake of Nixon. Nixon... Even though the term, the war on drugs, started under Nixon, the actual war on drugs did not start under Nixon. That making certain substances illegal, that started under Teddy Roosevelt. Adding more substances to that, that was the uh, Pure Food and Drug Act, by the way, I had that in it. Making even more substances illegal happened under, you guessed it, Franklin Roosevelt. There was a, the war on drugs heated up during the 60s under Kennedy and Johnson. Nixon just gave it the name, the war on drugs. So really, the war on drugs didn't start with Nixon, he just named it the war on drugs. So if you're going to downgrade Nixon for this, you better downgrade Teddy Roosevelt who's in your top six as well. ...started the war on drugs, and we are still seeing the horrible effects of it, so that's why that top... Um, I wouldn't say the war on drugs has horrible effects. I could say, I would see people saying that it's kind of ineffective. Um, and also notice that he only just shows marijuana plants there, as if that is the only thing about the war on drugs is marijuana. I mean, if you want to legalize marijuana, I'm fine with that, but I don't think... Heroin, crystal meth, crack, and cocaine should be legal products. Um, and the thing is that most of the war on drugs is actually aimed at those products more than they are marijuana. Tops my list of problems with Nixon. Nixon got elected promising to end the Vietnam War. And guess what he did? He ended the Vietnam War. I mean, as a history teacher, you think he would know this fact when the Vietnam War had ended. But the war just dragged on during his presidency. Part of the reason why the war dragged on during his presidency is you had, like, over half a million soldiers in Vietnam, plus a lot of other staff. It would take quite a while to extract those soldiers safely from Vietnam and that staff. And we actually saw that with what happened in Afghanistan under Biden. You can't just drag everyone out real quick. you got to do a safe, controlled withdrawal. Plus, he was actually training the Vietnamese to defend themselves, which is what should happen in the first place. You can't blame um, Nixon for Vietnam because the failures in Vietnam, those were all Lyndon Johnson's failures. He's the one who should be sitting here for Vietnam, not Richard Nixon. See, Meanwhile, while secretly dropping bombs and cancer-causing chemicals on civilians in both Vietnam and Cambodia. The reason why he expanded the war into Cambodia... And I don't know if he's dropping cancer causing agents on civilians there, but that I'm, I'm sure that started before Nixon was president. You know, it's kind of like a continuation. Shouldn't the president had started to get more, you know, get more blame. But um, he expanded more to Cambodia because Cambodia allowed North Vietnam to use the Ho Chi Minh Trail to ship supplies and soldiers down into South Vietnam. What he did was what was in the best interest of the U.S. soldiers fighting in Vietnam at the time, which, once again, is his job. The president's job is to protect the United States and their military, so he did what was best militarily for the soldiers. In fact, it was a very brave thing Nixon did because he knew it would be unpopular, 
but he did what was best for the soldiers, not what was best for his own personal popularity in this situation. He implemented wage and price controls. Um, so did Harry Truman, and Jimmy Carter said they were, um, he implemented them too, but he said they were voluntary, but he used the government to make coerce companies to go along with it, but it didn't work because inflation was so bad. And the reason why he implemented wage and price controls is because the economy was destroyed by Lyndon Johnson before he became president. And this was horrible for the economy. A big reason why the horrible stagflation of the 70s occurred was... Stagflation did not occur because of wage and price control. Stagflation occurred because Lyndon Johnson um, spent a ton of money on the Vietnam War and his Great Society program, which combined. Plus, he convinced the Federal Reserve to increase the uh, money supply in the economy. He pressed for that. And those two things caused inflation. Well, then when inflation started getting out of control, he put in a phased tax increase. Well, the phased tax increase didn't stop inflation, but it caused a recession. And that's how you got stagflation, recession, and inflation at the same time. Um, that was caused by Lyndon Johnson. Um, when the oil, OPEC um, oil embargo happened in 73, which was a response to Nixon saving um, Israel from annihilation, um, that made it a little worse, but what really, um, really, but what exuberated stagflation was Jimmy Carter's policies, because he put in Arthur Miller originally in the Federal Reserve, and he had a very expansionary um, monetary policy. Then when he promoted Miller to Treasury, he put um, Paul Volcker because he had no other choice, no one else would take the job was because of his administration. Now, don't get me wrong, Nixon did a lot of good and was highly intelligent. Opening up relations with China, his policy of detente with the Soviet Union, and the creation of the EPA are probably my favorite three accomplishments of Nixon. Those three things alone are enough to lift him out of the bottom ten, especially the bottom five. But he had such poor character. <laughs> he really shouldn't be picking his nose on the camera. He should have cut that out. Okay. You're sticking out. Number four, Herbert Hoover. Whereas I do agree Hoover was a weak president, I think there were worse presidents than Hoover, more than at least 10 of them. So I don't think he belongs here. Very bad economically, but otherwise he was a good, solid president. Herbert Hoover, of course, makes many lists because of the Great Depression. It's actually a myth that Herbert Hoover did nothing in response to the early stages in what would become known as the Great Depression. This is why he's partially responsible for the Great Depression. He passed a lot of bad laws and did a lot of bad policies on the fiscal side that helped cause the Great Depression. But you can't totally absolve the Federal Reserve that was creating a major credit crunch at the time. Federal Reserve caused the initial stock market crash. And they shrank the money supply by 33% during Hoover's four years in office. So I'd say the Federal Reserve was more responsible for the Great Depression, but Hoover was partially responsible as well. The Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act, for example, in 1929, raising import taxes, increasing income taxes to balance the budget, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to bail out businesses, and increased crony capitalism likely just made things worse. Under his watch, a recession became the Great Depression. His treatment of the World War I bonus army veterans in D.C. was disgraceful. Actually, this is a very misunderstood part of history. He did not tell um, General MacArthur to, you know, oust the people. He wanted to get the people out of the, um, I think they called it the Andalusia. I think they called it Hooverville. Basically, there was a bunch of um, tents and shacks, and it was actually very um, unsafe. So he wanted them moved out of there, but he didn't. But MacArthur exceeded his orders and basically attacked the people. So MacArthur was guilty of the bad stuff that happened. Hoover just took responsibility and took the fall, kind of the way Kennedy took full responsibility for the Bay of Pigs, even though there were other people that helped plan and press for that. So really, I think he acted properly there. MacArthur screwed up, and he kind of gets the blame for it. I guess he does deserve some of the blame because it was the person under his command. Simply put, Hoover did try to end the Great Depression, but simply made it worse. FDR didn't have much success either after. 
FDR did pretty much the same stuff Hoover did, just on a larger scale. But FDR had one, two huge, actually, things in his favor that Hoover did. Hoover came in, the economy was already really, really good. So when things are really, really going really good, there's a long way to go down. By the time Roosevelt came in, the economy was already really, really bad. So there really was nowhere for the economy to go but up. So he had basically the economy bottomed out as he was becoming president. Plus, the Federal Reserve reversed policies under Franklin Roosevelt. They went from creating a credit crunch where they reduced the money supply by 33% to where they increased the money supply in his first two terms by 47%. So Roosevelt had some advantages that Hoover did not. Plus, he actually got to see what Hoover did that didn't work, but he kind of just did more of the same thing. After that, but at least FDR seemed to be more in touch with ordinary people. Hoover seemed very out of touch with. It is true Hoover was a terrible speech maker and seemed out of touch, but the um, that doesn't make him worse than someone that's a good speech maker that can fill your campaign, as Bill Clinton would say. He was just a better pop. Roosevelt was a better politician and more charismatic. Most Americans. Number three, Franklin Pierce. I agree here. I don't put him in the bottom three, but he was pretty bad. Oh, Pierce, where do I begin? I know. How about with the Kansas-Nebraska Act? This is really the only thing about Pierce that really should rank him poorly. Um, basically, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which his first instinct was to veto, well, he got talked into it by Jefferson Davis and Stephen Douglas, ended up splitting the political parties along sectional lines because the Republicans became a party of the North and a lot of Northern Democrats became Republicans. And in the South, um, there were no Republicans and some, a lot of Southern Whigs became Democrats. So kind of, so in that way, it did probably make the Civil War inevitable and it did lead to bleeding Kansas, which he mishandled as well. But otherwise, he wasn't a bad president. Um, I feel sorry for him because he had a very tragic life, but he is a bottom 10 president, so I can't argue with that point. Again, a law that was one of the worst laws passed in American history, and he signed it in the law. A doe face. It is true he's a doe face, but the original doe face is Martin Van Buren, and most people don't recognize that he was the first doe face. Sorry, that was a little harsh there, but, you know, a most people don't even know what a dofus means, so that's not really all that harsh. Northerner who was perfectly fine with slavery. The it was a northerner with southern sympathies. Um, since it's showing the Ostend Manifesto, actually, it wasn't Pierce that did this. It was um, three of his foreign ministers, one of which was um, James Buchanan, that basically made this manifesto, and when it came to light, um, it was a big embarrassment. Um, Buchanan was the um, minister to Britain, but the minister to Spain was supposed to try to purchase um, Cuba from Spain and not threaten them to get Cuba from Spain. So they didn't really follow orders. And the thing is, is that getting Cuba from Spain would have actually been a really good thing for the United States. Because if you look at since the Ostend Manifesto, Cuba was pretty much a thorn in the United States side, at least until the early 1980s. So, I mean, think about that from the 1850s being a thorn in the side until the 1980s. Think of all the stuff that could have been avoided if, you know, the United States had acquired Cuba. The Ostend Manifesto. Pierce seemed to be okay with declaring war on Spain if it refused to sell Cuba to the that was not his orders. His orders was to try to purchase Cuba. United States. Pierce wanted Cuba annexed as a slave state. Um, slavery already existed in Cuba. I just picture doesn't really look like Cuba, but they piece hair missing. But um, slavery already existed in Cuba, so I mean he would have annexed it, and it would have been a slave state. But um, uh, Pierce was for adding territory to the United States. He got the Gadsden Purchase from Mexico. He also wanted to purchase the Baja Peninsula of California, but the Gadsden Purchase was not uh, going to have slavery in it. Um, so he was really basically just a guy that wanted to, you know, he was basically kind of like Polk, but he didn't try to go to war. Like Polk really, he went to war with Mexico to grab territory. And he almost went to war with Britain to grab even more area than what we got out of the Oregon Territory. So he was much more peaceful than Polk, but he wanted that expansion. It also should be noted that he paid down a major part of the federal debt while president. Um, 
and the economy was generally pretty good during this term, so he wasn't all bad. Boy, did that make Northerners happy. At a rocky time when the country needed unity, Pierce arguably helped further divide the country. Also, at a time when the country needed a more hands-on and active president, he was not. Did the country need a more active president? I don't know. Did they? Do you think someone trying to pass a whole bunch of laws would have made things better, especially when everything was viewed through the lens of pro-slavery versus anti-slavery? Probably not. Probably. But you know who was worse? Number two, James Buchanan. I agree here, James Buchanan was a really bad president too, and he is a bottom five president. That's right, Buchanan was worse. He took over as president after Pierce, and instead of learning from Pierce's mistakes, he just let the country become even more divided. Another case. You didn't have to bleep that out. I said See, the thing there is he's got two of the doe faces, but he misses out on the third one in Martin Van Buren. Okay, doe face. He was a president who did nothing. He didn't want to make... He wasn't a do-nothing president. I mean, he did a lot of things bad. Um, he presided over a really bad recession, the Panic of 1857. Um, he did things with currency that created a credit crunch. I think he outlawed bills below a certain denomination, paper money, which made that worse. Um, when there was a rebellion in Utah, he, which really wasn't much of a rebellion, he took the um, worst version as being true and went after it, causing what was called the Utah War. Um, thankfully, um, court has prevailed and there was no real actual war out there. So he was against rebellion in Utah, but not in the South. Um, he, tried, he was tried to start a war with Mexico to take over some of their northern provinces, which didn't go along well. Um, so he wasn't a do-nothing president. He just, you know, he also favored a lot of bad things as far as he tried to force Kansas into being a slave state, accepting what was called the Lecompton Constitution, which was arrived at through fraud. So he wasn't a do-nothing president. He just didn't do anything good. Anyone mad, but he also didn't want to make anyone happy. He was personally against... He wanted to make the South happy. He was very pro-South. ...slavery. He said it was morally wrong, and yet proceeded to speak out in favor for the Dred Scott decision. When the issue with the Dred Scott decision was not only did he speak out in favor, what he did was he went to um, Supreme Court justices that he knew and asked them how the case was going to go, and when he found out the case was going to be a close decision, he actually helped to... A close and a narrow decision, he actually helped to, and it was going to be against Dred Scott, he actually got a few justices to change their vote so it would be a wider decision and a, you know, a more um, majority-based decision. He got them to widen out the decision, which basically what the decision said was that the Missouri Compromise of 1820 was null and void and slavery could not be um, restricted in any in any. Um, territory in the United States. So he intervened, he interfered with the Dred Scott decision. Then he came out before the decision happened saying that no matter what happened in the decision, we should all follow it when he knew exactly what that decision was going to be. That was a very dishonest thing to do. One of the worst Supreme Court decisions in American history. A lot of people probably call that the worst decision because it basically said, I mean, maybe I'm going a little overboard, but it basically said, Black people really weren't people, so they didn't count. Because it even said free blacks couldn't sue in court. So it's like they didn't even have rights if they weren't slaves. In fact, he was so pro-South that he basically just let the South do whatever they wanted. When the states seceded after the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860, he blamed the Northerners. And the he did put some blame on the Northerners, but um, you can't blame him for the states seceding, but you can blame him for... I mean, you can't really blame him too much in that thing, but he was an awful president before that happened. And his Secretary of War actually aided the South after secession, so that has to count against him, because once again, he put the guy in place, so that does count against him. The abolitionists. By the time he was out of office, the United States was on the brink of civil war, and the Union had fallen apart, and he did absolutely nothing to stop it. And the worst president in American history, in my opinion, is Warren Harding. He once said... This is actually an absolutely ridiculous choice. I mean, 
we were actually on the brink of civil war at the cannon and Harding was somehow worse. Yeah, right. Said, quote, I am not fit for this office and should never have been here. It should be noted that John F. Kennedy said a very similar thing. Um, someone asked him if he's going to write a, you know, a biography about his presidency after hearing, and he said, "Who would want to read a book about failure?" So sometimes presidents do say things that kind of doubt, you know, self-doubt. So you can't just completely, like, say, "Oh, he said this. He was terrible." If you've got a pack of hot dogs in the kitchen, fortunately, there's toss them in the trash. Them, but I can skip them. So you got to see something about hot dogs. I yeah. agree. He appointed many of his corrupt buddies to be. If you look at this seat of people, most of these people were very good. You have other than Harding, um, Andrew Melling, one of the best secretaries of treasury. Um, Charles Evan Hughes, one of the best um, secretaries of state and a statesman of the day. You got Herbert Hoover back here. Calvin Coolidge, I mean, he appointed one bad guy to his cabinet. Albert Fall, but it should be noted that Albert Fall fooled everyone. He was unanimously um, confirmed by acclamation by the Senate, something that had never happened before. He actually did a lot of things that were good for the um, Interior Department, like making it more efficient. Uh, but the issue is that he did, he was accused of taking bribes to allow um, no bid contracts in the teapot dome. But the thing is the people that were accused of bribing him were acquitted of actually bribing him. So that's kind of weird, but yeah, he was crooked. That's one cabinet member that was crooked. Um, every president puts in at least like one or two bad appointees. They just over focus on Albert Fall. And really the teapot dome wasn't big until years later when story started focusing on it. He and his cabinets, some of them famously got in trouble for bribery and just one. What became known as the Teapot Dome Scandal. I know this sounds bad, but he was probably our dumbest president. Um, first off, it's hard to say which presidents were the smartest and least smart. Most people would probably say Andrew Jackson the most who couldn't spell, but once again, Woodrow Wilson was one of our most intelligent presidents, and he was our worst president. So intelligence doesn't make a good president. Plus, he admits that Nixon was very intelligent. He puts him on the bottom of his list. He was not a deep thinker at all. He seemed to just let all of his corrupt buddies make all the decisions. This was actually a falsehood that was in a book by a guy that was basically a, a caricature of the president. Um, a couple of these books come out that were completely false. One was by a um, guy wrote a book that he wrote a um, fictional accounting of the presidency. And then there's another guy called Gaston Means who was a basically a con artist wrote a book to make money. And he could never back up any of his claims. And many of them were actually proven to be false. He didn't stand for anything. You didn't know where he stood because he actually, he, he actually did stand for things. The guy went down into the South, the Deep South, in the 1920s and spoke out in favor of civil rights, something no one else did. He was against anti-lynching and tried to get anti-lynching laws passed. When the bonus bill passed, which was very popular, he vetoed it, which was a, probably one of the more unpopular vetoes, which proves that the man actually did have things he stood for rarely stated where he stood on issues. He seemed to have no moral compass. Once again, he was against, you know, he's for civil rights and things like that. He did have a moral compass. While president, he would often cheat on his wife. He did have an affair before he was president that was found out about, but, you know, JFK, LBJ, FDR, and Clinton all had affairs as well. Many of them while they were president, yet none of them are on this bottom ten. Fact, Kennedy's in the top ten. Um, and the affair that while he was president, that actually that's never been proven. Um, there's some DNA evidence that tries to say that um, Nan Britton's daughter was his daughter, but the actual DNA proof would not hold up in court of law because the DNA is too far removed from both Harding and Nan Britton's daughter, so it wouldn't hold up. And he had had parties in the White House. A lot of presidents have parties in the White House. Where they would illegally gamble. Gambling's not illegal in the White House. And smuggle in alcohol at the height of prohibition. The way prohibition worked was that if the alcohol was made before a certain date, it was legal to have. So you'd have to actually prove that the, law, the alcohol was made after that date, which I don't think was ever actually proven. And I got by what is proven, not rumors when I write presidents. He didn't ever get much work done. 
Um, this is another false thing. Um, he got a lot of stuff done. He passed a Revenue Act of 1921, the Budget and Accounting Act of 1921, the Emergency Tariff of 21, the Ford and McCumber Tariff of 22, the Federal Highway Act of 1921. He signed treaties with all the defeated um, former Central Powers. He had the Washington Naval Conference, which signed like a series of five treaties with countries all around the world, not just the United States. But Britain, France, Italy, and Japan were among the countries in there. He reversed um, T.R. Wilson's foreign policy, which you could call the bad neighbor policy, and started what became known as the good neighbor policy. He didn't call it that until Franklin Roosevelt was president, but he started that. He also freed all the political prisoners Wilson had um, imprisoned under the Espionage Act, the Sedition Act, and his Pomeranes. So the man did actually do quite a bit, especially when you consider that he was only president for roughly two and a half years. Um, this video is getting quite long, so I'm going to end here. He just babbles on more about parting the rest of the way. You can go to his video and watch that. I didn't cut anything else out. Um, but he also goes into the fact that Harding had an affair. Well, I already covered He says Harding had an affair, but to say Harding is the worst president of all time, I think really shows a lack of historical knowledge. I mean, you left out Andrew Jackson, um, who was a very pro-slavery president. Um, he left out Martin Van Buren, who was a doe face, pro-slavery, with Andrew Jackson, did the Indian Removal Act, um, failed miserably during the um, Panic of 1837. He left out Grover Cleveland, who was at the same, although he puts him second overall, he had the same type of racist policies that Andrew Johnson did, plus he was bad in the economy and bad in foreign policy. So lots of bad presidents left off this bottom 10. And Harding is a joke. The odd thing is that his third favorite president is actually Calvin Coolidge. And Coolidge was pretty much just Harding 2.0. He just carried out Harding's policies. That was it. Well, thank you for watching. Have a great day. This is King Rex. Please like, share, and subscribe.